So the first thing on our menu for not your average algebra is to think about what is the study of not theory? What kinds of questions do not theorists ask and answer? Uh, and what are some of the fundamental ways in which they do so? The most important for us are going to be the idea of what are not invariants. So for mathematicians, what knots are is they are smooth, in fact simple, embeddings of the circle inside of three-dimensional space. Uh, what that means is it's the same thing as taking a, a circle of rope and just twisting it up in some way and setting it inside of three dimensions. Sometimes we think of that three dimensions as being R3. Sometimes, if compactness is important, we'll consider this to be the three spheres, so we'll close it up by adding a point at infinity. Um, it's a smooth embedding for us in this talk just because I like the picture of a knot that doesn't have any sharp corners. There is a parallel theory of knots that does study piecewise linear knots and so forth, but for us, because I want nice, pretty, smooth pictures, I want a smooth embedding. It also needs to be a simple embedding in the sense that we cannot have this uh, knot intersect itself. Uh, so there's not, two, uh, there's not two places on this circle that both have the same image uh, under this function. So what we're really doing is sort of parameterizing the image of some knot sitting in three dimensions. And because it's the circle, that means that unlike a knot that we tie in real life, uh, which usually has two open ends that we can use to untie it, um, our knots are going to close back in on themselves. We also abusively, at least I do, um, don't think of this always as a function. We tend to conflate the knot k with the image of that function inside three dimensions so that we can treat this as a geometric object. We can treat it as a curve sitting inside of three-dimensional space. If we fix an orientation on our circle, for instance, by parameterizing it counterclockwise or something like that, um, and my function preserves that orientation, then we also get an orientation on our knot as well. Sometimes studying oriented knots is important. Sometimes it's less important. For about the first half of the seminar, orientation won't matter. Uh, and for the second half, we will introduce orientation. Uh, and so it will matter for us a little bit later on. What is the most important question in knot theory? The most important question is, when are two knots the same? So if you give me one parameterization of one knot, you give me another parameterization of another knot, how can I tell whether those two knots are, in fact, the same knot? Which leads us to the question, what does it mean for two knots to be the same? What is our notion of equivalence in knot theory? For most knot theorists, the notion of equivalence that we want is free isotopy. This is the idea. In other words, two knots are going to be equivalent if there is a continuous function from not the circle, but the cross product of the circle with the interval into R3, such that when the parameter on this interval is 0, the function restricts to the knot k1. And when this function uh, restricts to uh, the point on the interval of 1, then we get the knot k2. In other words, what this looks like is I've got my two knots. There are my two parameterizations, k1 and k2. Um, and if these two knots are, in fact, free isotopic, that means that if I fill in these two circles into a cylinder, so one of my original circles, my k1 domain circle, becomes the point at 0, my k2 domain circle becomes the point at 1, and then I also have everything in between, so I make this cylinder, i cross s1. And if these two are free isotopic, that means that there is a continuous function from this cylinder to a sort of knotty, twisty cylinder over here, uh, which has k1 at one end of it and k2 at the other end of it. Um, so this is the, the general picture of what it means. But most topologists, myself included, um, think of isotopy where this cylinder coordinate is really more like a time variable. And we think of isotopic knots as things where we can just smoothly bend one of them into the other. So if we had a physical copy of k1 that we could get our hands on, then k1 is isotopic to anything which we can freely bend and twist and, and just deform that knot inside of three-dimensional space without cutting it, without doing anything drastic to it, but just by smoothly bending some of its, some of its arc, some of the rope around inside of space. So that's our notion of equivalence. We can make the knot bigger if we want to, smaller if we want to. We can twist it a little bit more if we want to, but we can't cut it or do anything discontinuous to it. Uh, that's our notion of equivalence, called isotopy. And so that frames the fundamental question of knot theory as how do we classify all knots in the universe up to isotopy? So if isotopy doesn't matter, what knots exist out there in the universe? What kinds of knots can I make? How can we classify them into categories? And most importantly, for the process of classification, how can we tell two different knots apart from one another? So for example, here are a 
diagrams of two different knots. I'm going to call them K1 and K2. And I just said the word different, but I haven't convinced you that these two knots are different. And we shouldn't be convinced in general that two knots that we just draw at random uh, are the same or, or different. Um, so the question is, if one person hands me this knot on the street, another person hands me that knot on the street, how can I tell whether these two knots are the same up to isotopy? So these are going to be our two friends for the rest of this seminar. How can we tell these two knots apart if they are, in fact, different? So what we just saw on the last slide were not really knots, but they were not diagrams. Because you're watching this video on a two-dimensional screen, essentially, um, the best that we can do to understand what a knot is is by looking at a two-dimensional projection of the image of that knot from three space. And that projection is what we call a knot diagram. To get a knot diagram, we take the image of a knot, K, we fix a hyperplane, sigma, so a two-dimensional plane inside of my three-dimensional space, and then I just take the orthogonal projection of all the points on that knot down onto that plane. So I'm really just sort of shining a flashlight on my knot down onto this flat surface, and I get a knot diagram, or sometimes it's called a knot projection by knot theorists. Problem with doing that uh, is that in general position, if I orient this hyperplane just so, um, I'm going to make it so that there are always going to be two different points that project down to the same point on my plane. Uh, we call those two to one points the crossings of my knot diagram. So this red knot over here is a, a, a knot, the simplest non-trivial knot, in fact, called the trefoil. And when I take a projection of the trefoil knot onto any hyperplane, in general position, I'm going to get a diagram that has three crossings in it. And to finish this diagram, we also need to note on this diagram which of the strands of my knot is passing over which one and which one is passing under which one. Um, because we don't have self-intersections in our knot over here on the left, we can always uh, articulate which strand is passing over which one uh, anytime there's a crossing. The way we do that formally is we define a height function uh, above this hyperplane, and then anytime we have a crossing, we just take that uh, strand which has the larger value for this height function and make that the overstrand and make the other one the understrand. Um, and so we do that just by uh, decorating up the crossings a little bit to indicate which one is over which one, which one is under which one. Every knot diagram uh, defines for us a number of crossings, which was three in this case, and also uh, once we resolve the overs versus unders, it also divides my uh, looping stuff here into arcs. My arcs are these connected components of my knot diagram. So this particular knot diagram for the trefoil had three crossings. It also has three arcs. If we were to make the opposite choice for this height function, so if we switch up with down and down with up, that's going to have the effect of reversing my overs versus my unders in my knot diagram. Uh, and what we get is a new diagram called minus k. It reverses all of the crossings of that knot. Also, this particular knot diagram has a nice feature to it. Um, specifically, if we orient this knot and then follow the arc all the way through the knot, we find out that we're going to encounter overcrossings and undercrossings alternately. So I start here, I, I end up going over a string, and then I end up having to go under a string. And then I end up next going over, and then next going under, and so forth and so forth. We call those diagrams alternating knot diagrams. And those are really, really nice, because it means any alternating diagram is going to have a one-to-one -one correspondence between arcs and crossings, because each arc is going to cross over one and only one crossing. So this is great, and we can learn a lot about knots by drawing knot diagrams. In fact, if you hand me a diagram for a knot, that should be enough of a recipe for me to take a physical piece of rope and make a three-dimensional copy of that knot. But Diagrams have a little bit of a problem, because different knot diagrams can nevertheless represent the same knot. After all, when we defined diagrams, we selected a hyperplane. We selected a sigma here on which to project this knot. Does the diagram that we get depend on that selection? Also, are there other isotopy things that we can do to our knot, which are not going to change the identity of the knot itself, but which might change the diagram that we use to represent that knot? And unfortunately, the answer is yes. Different diagrams can nevertheless represent the same knot, which is kind of a problem. Fortunately, it's a problem we can resolve, because it was resolved by Kurt Reitemeister early in the 20th century. This is a classical result in knot theory. And the result is that any two diagrams of the same knot, up to isotopy, must be related one to another by a finite sequence of only three what are called moves.
We call these the Reitermeister moves in knot theory. The three moves are called, colloquially, the twist, the poke, and the slide. It makes them sound like dance moves. Um, Reitermeister called them type 1, type 2, and type 3, um, based on how many crossings each one of them engages in the knot diagram. So the type 1 Reitermeister move is also called the twist. Uh, and the idea behind it is that if I have a feature that looks like this in my knot diagram, one of these little loops that doesn't really seem like it's very important to the overall structure of the knot, I can untwist that loop and forget about it. So that's called the type 1 Reitermeister move. And the effect that it has is that it can take the number of crossings in my knot diagram and reduce the number of crossings by 1. Or if they find it useful, I could go the opposite direction and increase the number of crossings by 1. But we can use the type 1 Reitermeister move then, probably, um, to take a knot diagram which might have a bunch of crossings and hopefully try to reduce it so that it has fewer crossings. Ideally, if we do that enough, we can get down to the simplest possible uh, knot diagram for a given knot. So the type 1 Reitermeister move, we can convince ourselves that this move is an isotopy move on knots. It doesn't actually matter to the identity of the knot itself, but it does change the diagram a little bit. The type 2 move is sometimes called a poke, and it's called type 2 because it involves two adjacent crossings in a knot diagram. And when two adjacent crossings in a knot diagram both have the same uh, over versus under, so if I go over a strand and then immediately over it again by doubling back, then we might expect we can just take that loop and slide it back over so that it no longer lies over this strand. We're not going to be changing the fundamental structure of the knot, because that's an isotopy that we're doing right there, but we are simplifying the diagram, in particular, by reducing the number of crossings by two. So the type two Reitermeister move, the poke, um, can either add or remove crossings in a knot diagram in pairs. Uh, Any time that I have a, uh, an instant double back that goes over and then over, or also under and then under the same strand, I can remove that uh, so that the strands don't even cross one another at all. Finally, the type 3 Reitermeister move is sometimes called the slide, and it's type 3 because it's involving three crossings in this example. One here, one here, and one there. And uh, we arrange the strands, the arcs in this diagram, in such a way that I have one crossing and another strand which is passing underneath both of the arcs that are involved in that other crossing. And the slide just takes that strand which is passing underneath and it slides it to the other side of this big crossing here in the middle. So I'm just taking this underneath arc and I'm moving it from the left side of that crossing to the right side of this crossing. It's easy to convince yourself that that too should be an isotopy move that happens to the knot in three-dimensional space. This is called the type 3 Reitermeister move. Unlike the other two types of moves, this move doesn't actually change the number of crossings that are in a knot diagram. So we're not usually going to be able to use this move directly to simplify a diagram so that it has fewer crossings, but it's very clearly an isotopy move, and so it needs to be a part of our Reitermeister move universe. Now it's easy to convince ourselves that all three of these things don't actually change the type of knot that we're looking at, that in three-dimensional space these are just isotopies. What's not obvious, and this is the power of Reitermeister's result, is that these are the only three ways that we can change a knot diagram without changing the type of knot itself. And so any two diagrams according to this result of the same knot must be related by some finite sequence of these three moves. Finally, what we ultimately want to study in knot theory is not diagrams, but we want to study knots. So the question is, how do we know when we're studying a property that belongs to knots rather than a property that might belong to specific diagrams of that knot? And the Reitermeister moves gives us that answer. It tells us that any property which I can assign to a knot diagram, which is preserved by each of these three moves, must be a property not of the diagram, but of the knot. Because any way in which I can change a diagram is going to be a combination of these three things. And because these three things don't change a property which is preserved by these moves, that must mean that that property is a knot property and not a diagram property. We call such properties knot invariants. So knot invariants are the things that we want to study in knot theory because they're properties that belong to the knot and not to a specific diagram of the knot. So we can reframe our question about these two nasty looking knots into the question of if these two are in fact the same knot, then there must be, according to Reitermeister, a sequence of Reitermeister moves that takes one of these diagrams and transforms it into the other. Which is true, but 
this is a really, really, really hard way to approach the question of non-equivalence um, because it's a computationally enormous problem to resolve. Um, something on the order of 10 to the 15th or 16th, and so it's just the, the number of uh, the tests that I would have to do to determine whether one of these can be transformed into the other grows so rapidly with the number of crossings in a knot diagram um, that it's computationally just virtually impossible to use the Reitermeister equivalence directly to verify when two knots are the same knot or not. Um, so it's not going to be the way that we're going to approach the question of equivalence, but in theory, at least, we could. So what are some other invariants that we could use to study knots? Some of the simplest invariants are those which assign just a number, uh, a positive integer, uh, to a given knot diagram. And once we verify that that number is not changed by the three Reitermeister moves, we can also say that that number is a property that belongs to the knot and not to the diagram. So three of the, the most interesting that knot theorists study are called the crossing number, the bridge number, and the unknotting number. The crossing number of a knot is the minimal number of crossings that exist in any diagram of that knot. We can show that that's not invariant because of this minimality criterion. Once we have the simplest possible diagram for a knot, the number of crossings in that diagram is called the crossing number, and that's an invariant of the knot. So can the crossing number tell these two awful knots apart from one another? Well, if you believe me that these are the simplest diagrams for these knots, all we would have to do is then count the number of crossings. If I count the number of crossings in each of these diagrams, I find out that each one of them has 11 crossings. So, because they have the same number of crossings, the same crossing number, the crossing invariant is not enough to tell these two knots apart. The next numerical invariant is called the bridge number. And the bridge number goes back to that notion of defining a diagram by choosing a hyperplane and projecting onto that hyperplane. And the bridge number tells me what is the minimal number of arcs that exist on either side of that hyperplane for the right choice of that hyperplane. And the bridge number for each of these two knots is 3. So that invariant also is not powerful enough to distinguish these knots from one another. Probably the most interesting, in my opinion, of these three numerical invariants is called the unknotting number. The unknotting number is an effort to get at the complexity of a knot by asking how difficult will this knot be to untie. And the way it does that is it looks at crossing changes, reversals. If I change an overcrossing to an undercrossing in a diagram, we call that a crossing switch or a crossing change. And the unknotting number for a knot is the minimal number of crossings that we need to reverse in order to completely untie the knot. In other words, to turn it into a diagram of the unknot which is just an untwisted, unlooped, unknotted circle. So what the unknotting number is for each of these two knot diagrams is not easy to compute at all. Um, but it's known by results in knot theory that each of these two knots has an unknotting number of two. That means that there exists a pair of crossings which undoing those crossings, reversing them from overs to unders or vice versa, completely is enough to turn those diagrams into diagrams of the unknot. Um, I don't know which two crossings those are, um, and I don't feel like finding them, but those two exist. And that means, too, that the unknotting number as a knot invariant is also not enough to distinguish between these two knots. The unknotting number is probably the most notoriously difficult to find of these three knot invariants. Uh, and in fact, there is a, a lot of relatively simple knots for which we don't yet know what the unknotting number is. There are even some knots with fewer crossings than these. There are some 10 crossing knots uh, for which we don't know the unknotting number. There's a great database of knots uh, on the, uh, the website of knot theorists Charles Livingston and Jay Cha at Indiana University um, that tabulates a whole bunch of knots and all kinds of different data about them, including numerical invariants like these, other higher invariants, um, a whole, almost anything that you would need to know about knots you can find in that database. Um, and so you can see that there are some knots with 10 crossings, a crossing number of 10, for which we don't yet even know what the unknotting number is. But the point that we've gotten to here is that these three knot invariants are not powerful enough to distinguish between the knots which are depicted in these two diagrams. So clearly, if we want to tell these two knots apart, if they are in fact different, we're going to need some more firepower. So the next step is to figure out how to go from using numbers to serve as invariants for knots, to using structures that have a little bit more meat on the bone. So we're going to look at how to build uh, an equation 
which can tell me how to color a knot diagram, and then how to turn that equation into a higher algebraic structure which we hope can completely classify knots.